Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Heap, I'm a composer from Washington DC, and in this second video blog I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the compositional problems that I came across while writing Divergent Impulses, a double concerto for the Duo Scordatore. Uh, a compositional problem is something that we run across frequently, it's just somewhere where you run into a block and you have to come up with creative ideas uh, as to how to get around it. The main block that I came across is that uh, the harmonic design I had for the piece, which if you remember revolves around the harmonic sequence. The violin and... For the viola. Uh, didn't really give them all that much material to work with. I decided on registral lock, which means that this note would always be in this octave, um, so you couldn't have, well, this note would always be in this octave, you couldn't have that G down there. Uh, and so, really what we were left with in the bottom half of the viola, at least, is those notes, which, while being very nice, uh, didn't really give me a whole lot of room for exploration. Uh, so what I decided to do is to split the piece into different sections. Uh, and I gave them all strangely Victorian uh, titles. So section one, I called A Stately Introduction to Our Impulses. Section two, in which our impulses explore their space. Section three, in which our ensemble picks sides. Section four, during which our impulses war with one another. Section five, impulsive. Section six, agreement. Section 7, Cadenza, a time for our impulses to strut together. And Section 8, during which we wrap things up. So uh, I decided to shift the registral locking uh, every other one. So in, in the first and the second sections, we start with the harmonic series starting on those two notes for the violin and the viola. Uh, and then by the time we get to the third part, we've moved those down an octave. So now the violin can use these notes. So we, we get a lot more of the, uh, the interesting chromatic notes um, earlier before we go up into the stratosphere. And the same with the viola. Again, we move uh, two further to impulsive and suddenly we're down here, so we have for the viola part so you can hear how it becomes a lot more chromatic, there's a lot more choice in notes and I think this, this uh, solution to the problem gives the piece a really nice shape uh, in terms of the note choices that I could make and the sounds that the audience will hear uh, to tie things together and to make it all a cohesive whole outside of this uh, this um, harmonic series, I came up with an agreement theme that uses notes from uh, both the viol violin and the viola lines. So you'll hear that G and C uh, are both prevalent there. Uh, and that's really heard only in the piano in the first section of the piece. Uh, by the time we get to four and five, during which our impulses war with one another and impulsive, uh, you really get to start hearing that in the violin and the viola as they struggle to find some sort of common ground. Uh, and then by the end, by agreement, it becomes the main theme. A couple of other ideas that come up. Uh, the viola, which I took, in, if you saw my first video blog, I talked about it being sort of a mad genius, mad character kind of thing. Um, turns out to be very hard to convey that madness with just this sort of happy sounding major chord. Uh, so what I did was make it more of a quirky character. And so one of the things that the viola does a lot is that sort of uh, little note in there. And it does it on different notes, so you could have... Uh, and that sort of sounds to me a little bit like a polka theme. Uh, and so by the, by the time we get to um, 
during which, uh, sorry, in which our ensemble picks sides, and impulsive we get uh, the whole ensemble taking up that polka and it becoming sort of a very quirky, strange thing that uh, really rubs against the the violin's more romantic feeling, the romantic feeling mostly given by big swooping lines, lots of triplets. There you go. Lots of thirds, that sort of thing, makes it very expensive. So, um, basically the shape of the piece is that, uh, in addition to these registral locks, we mostly switch back and forth between really just hearing the soloists and hearing the soloists with the ensemble. So at the beginning, uh, it's very, very slow, it's very, very sedate. We just get to hear the first few notes of each of these harmonic series, uh, and that's supported by the other instruments. And then by the second section, it's just the violin and the viola. They're expanding, they're mostly taking turns doing it, although the viola does tend to interrupt the violin a little bit uh, because it's quirky, right? Uh, and so that's that's more of just an introduction to the characters of the, the two instruments. By the time we get to the third section, uh, the other instruments start to choose sides, so they choose whether they're going to follow the notes of the viola or the notes of the violin. Uh, and they sort of take on that same material uh, as the instrument they're copying. Uh, then uh, I hope this isn't getting too detailed. Then in the uh, fourth section, the uh, violin and viola actually sort of go to war with one another. There's a lot more uh, clashing lines. They they play over each other a lot. There's some mocking where the violin goes up into you know the high range, and the viola tries to follow but can't quite get as high, and so the violin um, sort of really rubs that in by playing high for a long time, uh, whether the audience gets that or not. Mm. Uh, and so that comes to a head and everybody comes in it becomes a very rhythmic and uh, aggressive section where suddenly everybody chooses a different harmonic series. So the violin and the viola start in C and G. Uh, I think the piano has A flat. Uh, so everything starts to clash. Uh, and by the end of that section we reach a point of sort of maximum saturation uh, and go straight into the agreement section, which as I talked about in the last vlog, features the E, uh, E major, spectrum there, oh, and what happens is everybody finally arrives on that, and that change is really pushed by the piano, who's had that agreement theme all along, and as I mentioned, the agreement theme becomes the primary material there, oh. and then because it's a concerto, we have a little cadenza, uh, where things get kind of crazy, uh, but they're crazy together, they're working together to create a nice coherent sound. And then finally we have a, a short coda, uh, where we just wrap everything up. I hope that you enjoyed this video blog. Next time we're going to talk a little bit about the editing process after I finished the first draft. Uh, so tune in then.